For 15 years, uh, Aria tried to get personal real estate corporations for our members. It was like that Greek legend Sisyphus. Remember, he rolls the boulder up the hill, and then his curse is it always rolls back down before he gets it to the top. Hey, investors, Bradley here from Watson States, and you're listening to the largest, fastest growing podcast for Toronto real estate on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. As a broker and investor myself, I want to know where there's opportunities in our market. So we track them and we share them with friends just like you. But while we're tracking the news, we're kind of keeping in the know of what's going on. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of concerns and fears out there. Not a lot of solutions being put forward, which is precisely why we invited Tim Hudak, CEO of the Ontario Real Estate Association, to come on our show. They are a voice that is heard when it comes to provincial politics. And that's because they represent 82,000 realtors across Ontario, making them the largest real estate association at the provincial level across the country. Tim himself, a familiar face, if you've been following politics for some time, he's been in public service for 21 years at the Ontario legislature, as well as the leader of the provincial conservatives in Ontario for five years. Well, in his first year of coming on to ARIA, which has now been almost five years, he's coming on his fifth year this December, he was named one of the most powerful people in residential real estate by Swain Pole Power 200 in 2017 and 2018. Today, what we talked about was a little bit of insight on where some of the challenges, but really wanted to dive deep into ARIA's platform for change. What are they proposing in order to help and assist consumers and realtors alike? You're going to get a sense from our show, the strength and the influence that this organization has, which is why I'm so thrilled that Mr. Tim Hudak took some time to join us. If you guys got any value of the show, please like, leave us a comment if you have a question for myself or Tim and enjoy the show. Tim, how are you doing? Bradley, I am well, and I'm thrilled to be here on Toronto's number one real estate podcast. Thanks for having me on. You are absolutely a familiar face for some of our, we have many investors in our group, and I know you've got a very wide political um, history behind you, and maybe we won't get too far into that because we definitely have some, some land to cover here talking about real estate, but I want to kind of maybe give you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about ARIA. Tell us about what you guys are working on before we get into some of the, the challenges and issues that we're facing here in Ontario. Yeah, absolutely. So ARIA stands for the Ontario Real Estate Association. I'm honored to be the CEO of that operation. We're in the north part of Toronto. And we are basically uh, the voice for Ontario's now almost Bradley 85,000 realtors from Toronto to Kenora to Fort Erie to uh, Ottawa. Our three main functions, uh, number one, advocacy. So we represent the realtors and the men and women and businesses that they work hard for on the streets of Ontario each and every day. We're the main liaison with the province of Ontario and the regulator RICO, and we're in the media quite a bit, advancing issues like affordability when it comes to home ownership or rentals. Number two, we provide the standard forms in our province. Standard forms for those that are not realtors, that's the, well, the language that every realtor can speak to wherever he or she lives in the province. And if there's any kind of real estate complication or problem, we've got a forum to help solve that and represent our members and clients in those exchanges. And third, we do a lot of leadership training. So realtors, you know, you mentioned my time in politics. I spent 21 years in politics and public life. I was honored to represent the folks in West Niagara and parts of Hamilton and Niagara South. And I found, Bradley, that when I would go to community groups, there's always realtors who are active volunteers and leaders, whether it's a hockey club, gymnastics, a local food bank or shelter. So we, we help invest time and training in our realtors to give back to their community to play those types of roles. Those are our three main functions. Big focus in our discussion today, helping people get that next place to call home. You got it. That's where we're headed, folks. And um, guys, support the show. Feel free. I know Aria very much is out there. And, and as Tim's describing, to um, share on behalf of realtors and consumers, uh, folks out there in the real estate industry and kind of help them navigate. We do use those forms constantly. I, I know I use the Aria form on a seems like a daily basis at this point. And I really think we want to dive today into the advocacy because I'm very intrigued by the platform that Aria has. And before we kind of go down that road, I think I want to set a little bit of a context. We interview many guests with different perspectives. Some, we've had a landlord representative. We have what's coming soon coming up, a tenant advocacy group. There's a lot of advocates. There's a lot of people speaking for their different, their different um, groups. Their different, and so, however, Aria in many ways stands alone in the way that they have a dialogue with the government. 
And, um, and because of that, to me, what Aria has to say should be something we should be listening to because often it, it happens. One of the examples in, in a past win that I'd love, Tim, for you to kind of tell us a little bit about how this came to be is the uh, personal real estate corporations that we have now for the real estate industry. Could you give us a little bit of context on, on what happened there? Yeah, absolutely. So in, in many professions in, in Ontario, accountants, uh, lawyers, engineers, you can form your own personal corporation. That gives you some tax savings because the business tax rate much lower than the personal tax rate, especially as you do better, more successful in life. And you can reinvest in your business, hire people, invest in new technology. An artifact of the governing legislation for realtors from 2002 was that realtors couldn't form those corporations. And Bradley, get this, you could in six other provinces, not Ontario. So for 15 years, uh, Aria tried to get personal real estate corporations for our members it was like that Greek legend Sisyphus. Remember, he rolls the boulder up the hill, and then his curse is it always rolls back down before he gets it to the top. It was kind of like that. But in 2020, we were successful in getting that legislation passed. All four political parties supported it. And now realtors can form their own personal real estate corporations as of October of 2020. We just passed the one-year anniversary. Beautiful. So obviously we have, we have many listeners on our show just naturally that are licensed. And I guess on behalf of realtors, thank you, because it creates an opportunity for us to do what's seen in many other industries. And it's been kind of silly. It hasn't, but that is all thanks to the efforts of Aria. And, um, and, and based on obviously conversations that they're having with their membership. So given all of those things, we won't, we won't harp too much on it because there are those who aren't licensed, but I just wanted to kind of set the base here for everybody to understand um, kind of what, what's, uh, what Aria can do, the, the, the strength Aria has. So what I'd like to do here, Tim, is I, can you maybe outline for us the affordability, the bring affordability home campaign that Aria, I know I've been receiving emails talking about it, and there's been a constant call for, for feedback on that. What has come out of that plan and what is Aria's kind of stance? What is, what are, though politics is not at the polls right now, there's this continued um, election poll, I guess, uh, maybe poll is not the word, but there's a, there's a campaign that is ongoing beyond the elections from Aria. And I'm curious, what are the main points of that when, when we look at it? Yeah, you bet. And, and Bradley, before we get to that, do you mind, I just add a few more things to the personal real estate corporations? Just Absolutely. Sure. Your audience. Yeah. So when we brought this forward to government, we thought maybe three or 4,000 of our members would utilize it. And after a year, it's actually at 10,000 now. So if any of your uh, viewers want to learn uh, how to do that, why it might benefit them, go to aria.com and they can look up personal real estate corporations. And it is the gold standard. We're successful not only in getting the tool, but it's a gold standard because you can income split with a member of your family who would work for the corporation. You can have other businesses inside that corporation, maybe an investment business and enjoy those tax advantages. So um, when I told you we were behind the lawyers, the engineers and accountants, we actually leapt over them. And we're up there, I think only with the doctors in terms of the benefits there of a personal corporation. So I'd encourage uh, all the listeners on Toronto's number one real estate podcast <laughs> I get more details at aria.com. So we have a new campaign, and thank you for asking, called bringaffordabilityhome.com. And it is focused on helping families get the keys to a great place to call home. You asked me the main features. Uh, number one, creating more supply. I know you cover this regularly uh, on your podcast, that we have a lack of inventory in our province. You have more demand, smaller supplies. The basic economics tells you prices are going up, whether that's ownership or rental. So we want to get more inventory and give you more details on some of our ideas. Number two, to give first-time home buyers a break. As you know from your experience, Bradley, once you get in on the first rung of the ladder, it's easier to move up the ladder. It's helping people get into the market in the first place. So we're calling for a doubling of the land transfer tax rebate for first-time home buyers to save them up to $8,000. And the third major prong is getting dirty money out of real estate. We're very concerned that overseas drug lords, corrupt officials in corrupt countries, are putting their money into real estate in Ontario and in Canada because it's a safe investment. And then they hide behind numbered companies. We don't want to see a single parcel of real estate, a home, an apartment, go into the hands of a niece or nephew of a drug lord when it should be in the hands of a law-abiding Canadian citizen. Those are the three elements. Love it. Love it. And we'll dive a little bit into some of those. I think um, the, the, the last topic there is actually very 
um, flashy, right? You don't want to have the condo in the hands of the drug lord. We'll talk a little bit about that. I'm curious where that's headed because we haven't really covered that all that much on the show. But um, exclusionary zoning policies, it's one of the things that you guys talk about. I guess one, fill everybody in on what that kind of entails. What does inclusionary zoning look like um, in Toronto, in the GTA? And what what is the plan to, to have that changed over? For sure. So one of the things we hear from, from researchers and experts like yourself, Bradley, on how do we create more supply and choice in the market um, is to get rid of what we call exclusionary zoning. That could be like the biggest you know, hammer to make a, a difference in knocking down the walls to home ownership. Think, so I know we're here at the uh, Watson Estates in beautiful Caledon, Ontario, virtually or in person. So this may not be as much for Caledon, but we'll go a little bit south into Mississauga, say. So picture a wartime bungalow in Mississauga or Toronto major center. And right now, if you own that property or you buy it, you can knock down that bungalow. It's kind of you know worn out. And you can ba- build a, a four-story monster home right, for one wealthy family. And you can pretty well do it like that. It's no real obstacles in the way. But if, you know, Bradley Watson or one of his investors said, I want to turn that into three or four units, a triplex or something, so first-time buyers can get in the market, more affordable homes, you get put through the ringer. You have to go through a rezoning process. It takes up to a a year, a lot of fees, lawyer's costs, and then the NIMBY forces descend and they take advantage of the process and they chase that investment away. And that means that those three or four families, they won't get a home. Here's what we say. We call that exclusionary zoning, right? It's excluding those families from the neighborhood. Level the playing field. Continue to allow the build up where it's it's allowed, sure, but also allow that owner to build three or four properties on that parcel and open up new homes. That's a big part of our plan, and it's getting a lot of attention because it's the right thing to do, particularly in our urban areas. I love it. I love there's a lot of talk about cutting red tape. There's a lot of red tape. And I think that how that's going to be accomplished I'll leave that up to you <laughs> because it sounds like there's a ton of complexities, but you're right. It's absolutely the right thing to do. It also, I anticipate has a lot of investors salivating a little bit because it creates a platform for them to have multiple units to sever properties where they were otherwise held back, not to mention development charges and costs. So if we can speed that process up, supply is, I think single-handedly it's agreed across the market. 99% of people would agree supply is the challenge. So that seems to be a pretty quick way to address that. But obviously there comes with it a bit of pushback from, from locals because I don't, I don't want a fourplex next door, but I, I totally agree. I think, I think that's a, a, the right approach. Yeah. And this, so, and this may not be in, in every town, right? We're saying you should focus on what is common sense, focus on urban areas where there's high demand. Yeah. If it's close to a major transit station, for example, with 500 meters or, or a kilometer away, a walking distance away, and close to existing density. I think if we do that, Bradley, because you know the green belt, right? We were between Lake Ontario and the green belt and the GTHA, and we have to make better use of the land in between to allow people to get into the market for first time buyers, move up buyers or rentals. This is a real key to unlocking those homes. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I really like that portion of your plan. I really, really do. I, I also, let's, so let's jump into this beneficial ownership. Um, so back to the kind of cartel, who owns what, Maybe give us a little bit of context on what is the ongoing issue. I, I don't even know, to be honest, how many studies have been done or what the numbers are. Or maybe that's part of that plan. But no doubt, uh, even at the, at the federal level, we hear a lot of people wanting to protect housing, right? This idea of protecting the people who are already here. Could you explain for us beneficial ownership? Um, what, is that, what is ARIA's stance on that? And, and I guess, what does that look like? Because I know ARIA's got their position there, but it seems as though everybody in government also agrees with you. So there should, it seems like a pretty easy, straight road. You know what I mean? You'd think, and I think if it were not for COVID, quite frankly, this would be done by now because government yeah. is rightly consumed with stopping the pandemic or getting it to manageable levels because we've had a lot of interest and we're going to keep pushing it. In fact, I met with some ministers this past week to talk about it. So let me give you some details. And for folks um, watching Toronto's number one real estate podcast, uh, you can get all the details. Again, bringaffordabilityhome.com. And if you go to that site, there's also a button you can press to take action. And we will send a message directly to your MPP saying that, well, you can write it. You like this plan, do A, B, and C. We can tell by your postal code. And I'm, I'm telling you, if enough MPPs hear from real estate investors, real estate fans, agents, whoever, they're going to act. So again, bring affordabilityhome.com. Okay, here's how it works. So, so typically, you know, drug, drug lords, criminals, in foreign countries or corrupt officials are always worried that somebody that's more corrupt than them is going to come take their money. 
They want to survive. So they look to safe jurisdictions like Europe, United States, and Canada and Australia to hide their money. And they, they do it in areas like uh, luxury um, products, vehicles, boats. They do it into casinos. They wash the money that way and real estate. And a recent study of the British Columbia, I forget the exact number, but I thought it was over $20 billion in real estate across Canada, Ontario being number one, BC being number two. But they don't say Pablo Escobar, right? Bought the, the mansion down the street. Uh, they hide behind a numbered company. It's usually a relative they trust because it has to be somebody they trust that will be the owner of the property, but they hide behind the veil of these numbered corporations. In Europe, for example, in the United Kingdom, they took that away and exposed to own the homes. This allows the police back in Colombia or another country to track down the criminal um, money, attach it to the crimes or government officials. It shines a light. The U.S. in its own way has cracked down. Canada has not. So the money is increasingly coming into our country. So we're saying take away that veil of the number of companies, show who the owner is. That's a beneficial owner, they call it. And then we can see if it's an, an honest investment or if it's money coming from criminals or corrupt officials. And who would have access to see that? that and, now, and obviously this is being built, but who would see that? Would that be behind the same kind of veil? Like we can't just see who your neighbor, what the neighbor is on title. It would actually be protected or would this be public public information? We, we think we should be fully transparent. This problem is, is serious enough that it should be a fully publicly searchable um, registry. Uh, the name of the owner or owners. And, and that way too, Bradley, the people back in the originating country can make the attachments of where the money is going, work with right. the RCMP and shut it down. Now you could have it limited to the types of people like police forces, maybe real estate agents that could search it. We think the more transparent, the better, but we'll take anything. We gotcha. do have an option here in the province of Ontario called Terranet. You're very familiar with Terranet. It's probably the, the best source of real estate data anywhere in Canada. Terranet already is, is tracking foreign uh, investment. They report every year on what level of the marketplace are foreign buyers. And there's additional tax, as you know, on foreign buyers. This is really just taking that from a seven to a nine in terms of the data they collect. We've already got the engine, so let's put it to work. Well, we'll definitely be anxiously awaiting updates on that. And we'll be reporting it on our show. So I, I really, uh, I, again, thank you for standing on that. And um, we'll, everyone, we'll have the link down below for um for you guys to send that i i'm a little weird in that i i agree i like to send messages to my mpp and my mps and and i hope for people who are concerned about their investment concerned about their home in their area they should be doing the same thing especially when they honestly stand behind and believe these issues so can i tell you why that's particularly important i'm glad that you do that most people don't um if i take a couple minutes because i was there 21 years right and a couple of things. When, when you get um, an email or two, it doesn't really register as much as a politician. But when you start getting dozens to 100, we've developed that in the past. You say, holy smoke, something's going on there. And what we also do, Bradley, on these sites is you can individually write it. So if it's a carbon copy that goes to every MPP, they're like, ah, the person didn't really make an effort. If they write their own message or choose some of our paragraphs so it looks different, they're like, well, they took the time to write their own message. This is meaningful. And then on a weekly basis, the parties get together in what they call the caucus and the leader will say, hey, what's going on in the ridings? And these things popping up, oh my God, I got a hundred uh, emails about affordable home prices and, and these are the two or three ideas we're putting on the table. That really gets things going. Any good advocacy group is gonna have an air war and a ground war. The ground war is the meetings that we have regularly with MPPs, staff and decision makers, but the air war is the public that sort of bombard the politicians with these touches from time to time. That's why it's effective. And I would really hope people watching the show um, would take the time to do that. It's, it's evident to me why you guys are getting things done <laughs> when you start talking about it like that. And for many people, they do feel like they're in a war zone, right? We've got, right now we've had the election that just took place and you've heard many of the different platforms. I'm curious, what, what are some of the things that you liked from what you were hearing from the federal parties? Yeah, we put a, a like we're doing with our bringaffordabilityhome.com campaign. Similarly, we work with Korea and put out sort of a menu of here's what you can do nationally. Now, as you know, the biggest impact for housing issues is provincial and then municipal. The federal government is more like the bronze. It's kind of like we got an electrical problem and you ask your plumber to do it. They can probably make some attempt and not be perfect, but you still will use yeah. what you have available. So each of the parties uh, did take some items off of our menu and put them in their platform. A lot of what we saw from liberals, new Democrats or conservatives we liked. There were a couple of things that we were alarmed about and I'm glad to talk to you about those. 
But what I liked the most that there was a commitment to new housing supply. Um, there was a, in the conservative platform, one of our ideas is to take excess government land or buildings and put them into a real estate. The New Democrats talked about bringing back the 30 year amortization for mortgages, a prime vehicle, especially for first time buyers, as well as looking at ways of having through CMHC mortgages that allow for multiple uh, owners, uh, maybe splitting the ownership, a, a new way of getting into the market. We're happy to see that. The Liberals had a new savings program that kind of like we have with our RRSPs, but on steroids that would allow you to save up for that down payment. So each of them has some very positive ideas that can make an impact on the housing affordability crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So there's some of them and we, we had covered a lot of those. So what about what are the ones that kind of raise some concerns um, there? It's funny because I very rarely see um, real estate boards taking a, a stance, a political stance. They're usually kind of friendly in that regard, but there were definitely some major items that had some red alarms ringing uh, within our industry. I'm curious, what were some of the ones that, that kind of freaked you guys out of RIA out a little bit? Yeah. So there were, there were two, um, in, in the, uh, the liberal platform that were, you know, very concerning. There's a third I can talk about as well. Let me, let me focus on the, the biggest threats. Um, the, the liberal platform did talk about a flippers tax. And as you know, real estate already is one of the most heavily taxed items out there. I mean, maybe something else that you own that you have to pay a tax on every year, like you do with your property taxes, right? The, and alcohol and tobacco are heavily taxed as they should be because they're sins. Real estate is actually a good thing that spurs our economy and a prime source of savings. Here's a problem with the flippers tax. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell. Did somebody actually flip the home to try to take advantage of the principal residence uh, exemption on capital gains? Or did somebody die in the family? Or did they have to move because of the job? So you have to make sure that it's, you're going to target flippers that is, that is really pinpointed. But we actually worry this is uh, a foot in the door for a, a massive tax on home equity. When governments spend, 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 as they are rightly during, during COVID to, to keep us whole and safe and, and make sure we can get the economy going again. But then they turn to tax, tax, tax to pay the bills. And we're very worried that there is this, they're targeting um, eliminating the principal residency exemption for capital gains or part of that. So we're guarding against the foot of the door. So we'll be very aggressive to say, if you do that, you're going to actually blow up the economy. You're going to take away the prime savings of the vast middle class. And you're, you're breaking a social contract you've had with people for generations that when they retire, they can count the value of their home. See, I, I didn't see that side. So, so the part of the big argument, I mean, beyond the, the obvious, some of the, the, the scenarios with death or whatever, life, lifestyle changes, the bigger thing was this kind of fear that is permeated through everywhere right now with this primary residence exemption. So that was, I guess, the, the concern is, is that this is a stepping stone to that. Interesting. I, I, that I didn't realize. That, that makes a bit of sense to me. Here. It's the spidey senses that you get, just like you were <laughs> a good investment, right? Mine is, yeah. I think you're looking at this. You just would have to- Well, they absolutely dirt. are. I mean, we've seen that they are. They're yeah. looking, they're doing the math, right? Exactly. And uh, Earl Sadal, the former head of CMHC that just retired, had news about it. And now that he's been freed, he says we should, right? So, aha, uh -huh, you actually really wanted to do this bureaucrats, the editorial board of the Globe and Mail. There are just too many people who are comfortable, who are wealthy, um, who think, hey, what's the big deal? Let's take away the major tax savings for the middle class. And it would be devastating to so many families across. So we've got our guard up against that. Gotcha. Okay, give me the, the second juicy one here. <laughs> the second one <laughs> strikes me as somebody that, that's that been, been in the game for a long time, um, was written by a 25-year-old political staffer to try to win votes who's probably never sold a property in their lives. And that's to eliminate the traditional offer process that we've had since Canada uh, was born. And when you do that, when you have everybody reveal the contents of the offer, that's an auction. Whether it's standing on somebody's lawn like they do in Australia, whether it's an online auction, whether it's all the agents around the table playing poker and showing their offers. Um, it's, it's an auction. And the concern we have about this is, is, is as follows, because their proposal is to criminalize yeah. the traditional offer process. So let's say my mom wants to sell the family home. She's a widow. And then she finds out that she can't use her trusted real estate agent that she's used before, that's been around forever with the traditional offer process. It's how her dead parents did it, her grandparents that have done it. And you say, mom, it's got to be an auction. I'm going to be so scared of that 
that she would say, I'm not going to sell the house set. I have no idea what this creature is going to look like. I don't know what I'll get in return for my home. It's intimidating. So Bradley, think supply right now is a challenge. Imagine forcing everybody to go to an auction. And secondly, I just object that my mom would be criminalized. These exact same real estate practice has been around forever. I, I mean, the reason that they did it at the federal level of criminalized was because they didn't have their hands were tied in a lot of ways. So obviously that decision needs to be, should have been made at the provincial level, which brings us back to Aria and the province. So is that conversation now happening as a result? The liberals were elected. I, I personally believe the blind bidding was a big blow to their campaign, but given that they were elected in this position, is that a conversation that's happening or is that something that's we're looking to kind of move on from and let's let's not talk about this anymore. It's it's a, a bit of a been there done that, uh, but now that it's the liberals uh, nationally opened up again, we're, we're using belt and suspenders. So I'm mixing a few metaphors there. So been there done that. So we actually did do a total review of real estate uh, rules a couple of years ago. It's now we have a new law called the Trust and Real Estate Services Act. That's TRESA, it's 2020. One of the outcomes of that uh, is a personal real estate corporations greater powers for the regulator RICO to increase fines, suspend, revoke licenses for bad actors, do investigations, really powerful stuff that Ontario Realtors have been pushing for for some time. So we got that. As part of that conversation, Bradley, we did look at the bidding process and we said, hey, give people an option, right? So if you're participating as a buyer or a seller and you want to do an option, you know, God bless you. Just make sure everybody signs off and understands what they're sacrificing in privacy around giving all the contents of their offer to perfect strangers. If you want to do the traditional offer process, you know, um, do so. If you want to sell the home to a couple who reminds you of yourselves when you started out in life with your family, that should be your right. But for goodness sakes, this is the most precious commodity you own. It's the most valuable commodity you own that the homeowner should be in the driver's seat on how she sells her home. Just give her a choice. The provincial government agreed with us, and that's what they've done under the Trust and Real Estate Services Act. I, I don't know, I guess the spidey senses, my spidey senses tingle in the sense that I, I don't think this is a, a done issue. I, I honestly, some of the statistics I'm seeing heavily favor the removal of a blind bidding war. And I don't know if that means we look like Australia or if there's a hybrid model. I just, I don't get the sense that Tressa will answer every concern that people have. And, and I'm hoping something can be resolved. Um, and I think it's it's noble that you guys are on the side of pushing back because otherwise there wouldn't be any other voices at the table. And I think that, that that's a good dialogue that can happen. And ultimately, we're on the side of choice, right? Choose what kind of instrument that you want uh, to use. Um, and, you know, while the frustrated buyers, and I totally get that, my wife, Debbie, and I were frustrated buyers a while ago. We would get excited, we tour a home, we make an offer, we cross our fingers, you know, we improve our offer and then end up on the losing side. Like I totally get that where people are coming from. It's a cruel game of musical chairs with more people circling fewer homes. Number one, the way to solve that is increasing supply. But secondly, um, uh, with respect to polling, while frustrated buyers might like it, they'll also end up being sellers down the road. And sellers definitely do not like their choice being stripped away from them, let alone criminalizing an option for them. And then when people understand um, how auctions work and how it's been demonstrated in Australia and New Zealand where they're not forced to do auctions, they choose to do auctions. And why do they choose to do auctions in Australia, Bradley? Because it drives up prices. Auction fever develops. You get a rivalry with a guy that's across a tree for you or you don't like his picture online. You're not really in consultation with your realtor and you overbid on a home. Hmm. So auction fever actually drives up prices. We think this could uh, backfire if the government forces it. There you go, guys. You've got you've got all the sides here, and and I think it's up to people to to take a look at it. And uh, but I guess one question, just to kind of leave off here for you, is where do you see Ontario real estate in the next five years? How is it going to look um, with all of these things you guys are putting forward? Where do you see us going? So. I don't see any change in, in demand. Now, five years is a long time frame. Things can happen, but what's, you know, what is driving demand? Well, millennials are coming into the age where they're getting promoted, they're starting families. So then this is, because of immigration, the biggest generational cohort in the history of a country. They're bigger than the boomers coming into the market because their numbers are buttressed by immigration. So they're coming to the market. Their parents have a lot of savings. As much as they love their sons and daughters, they're willing to help them move out of the house and get a place of their own. Mortgage rates uh, are, high, are at record lows and don't look like they're going much higher. 
uh, if at all, for the short while. And immigration is going to come back in 2022. Plus, the GTHA is doing well. It's a great place to live. It's going to attract people from across the country. So I, I think all the demand indicators look quite strong. And then supply is, is the open question. So I think that bodes well for real estate prices across the board because of high demand. And it takes well for supply to catch up. We do believe we need about 100,000 homes uh, in this province per year to meet that growing demand wow. and also to catch up to how far we've slipped uh, in the past. So I remain hopeful that we can help more people get a home. We want to create that next generation of Canadian homeowners for sure. It builds our middle class. It strengthens our society. But I think it's going to be some time before supply catches up with demand. So it still will be upward pressure on prices. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, Tim, this has been a really good chat. Thank you for taking time to tell us some of uh, your thoughts, some of Rhea thoughts. Where can folks find you? Where, where are they best to connect with you on social, whether they're a licensed agent or a consumer that's looking to get more info? Yeah, so uh, ARIA is uh, our main website for information on real estate or studies. I mentioned ARIA.com, ARIA info on, on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. So ARIA is our across platforms. And me personally, it's Tim Hudak um, on Twitter and on LinkedIn, H U D A K. There's only one other Tim Hudak out there, and he is a martial arts expert out of Texas. As much as I may look like a martial arts expert out of Texas, which means I look like 0% of that, um, I'm the other guy. And that's how you can track me. <laughs> You must have a pretty good following then. He's like, why am politics, I so popular I did, I, yet? I'm not getting paid for what I do. In politics, <laughs> I, 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 well, I did. Real estate is really interesting to people and we're making a difference. So thank you for saying that. So that drives up the numbers. So the Texas guy I got to know because he kept, when I was in politics, he kept getting hate, hate mail or hate social media. Oh, poor guy. That's what's going on. So we <laughs> no wonder he's in martial arts. He's got a fight. He's got a fight or flight, right? <laughs> he happened to be a conservative. So he actually liked what I, what I stood for as well. But we actually connected and formed a club of Budax on Facebook and he was the chair and I was the vice chair. Tim, great chat today. Thank you for taking the time and uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on all the fun stuff you guys are doing over there. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm just waiting when we crack open that Watson Estates Chardonnay over your right shoulder. Right here? Really all right, let's do yeah. it. Let's do it. My place or yours. <laughs> I need to come out to the estates out there in Calendon and get out of the office. Now, Bradley, thank you so much. Really appreciate your expertise and how you're educating folks on real estate issues across our province and country. And a pleasure to be on today. Thank you. Absolutely. Everybody, if you could, please support the uh, this particular episode. Hit the like, leave us a comment. If you have a question for myself or Tim, you can also tag us on Instagram at Watson Estates. And we'll see you guys next time with another episode. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure.